Welcome to the Wonder Woman podcast. My name is Katie Freeman and I am your host. Every week I bring you two episodes interviewing female and non-binary makers of all kinds. This week's guest is Wu of Work in Use. Uh, Wu is a woodworker, furniture designer, as well as a professor in an art and wood program. And so we talk all kinds of things. We talk about being a professor currently uh, in times of COVID and how, you know, things work when they have to be virtual, as well as the classes that she is currently teaching. And just her history and getting into woodworking and furniture making. And it's a great great story. Um, You will not be disappointed. So before we head on into the interview with Wu, I want to give a big shout out and thanks to the patrons over on Patreon. So thank you so much, Kevin, Lefty's Woodshop, Christy, Twisted Twine, Christina B, Jeremy Spies, Sammy, Go Sammy Lee, Sven, Dwarf Size Workshop, Rachel Moody Makes, Bonnie, Tool Mom Bonnie, ToolMomStore.com, Laura Oakley Soap Company, Mary Lou Made by Mary Lou, Amy Bison Valley Carving, Dan and Kelly Reclaim Living Store, Brandy Studio Obey, Kathy One Girl and Her Tools, Ellen Little Bear Furniture, and Ethan, Ethan Carter Designs. Thank you all so very much for your ongoing and continued support helping me to produce two episodes a week every week. And with no further ado, here is Wu. All right. Well, I like to start out the podcast with having my guests introduce themselves. So when you are ready, I will let you do that. Okay. Are you, you're recording now? I'm recording. (laughs) Okay. okay. So I'm Wu and I am a furniture maker, designer, movement practitioner and I also teach um yeah (laughs) all right that's who I am (laughs) that's who you are uh what do you what do you teach yeah I am teaching at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design also known as MassArt it's in uh Boston and I teach in the sculpture department and currently I'm teaching projects in wood, which is like a introductory woodworking class. Mm-hmm. I also teach a joinery class and I teach a sculpture studio. Okay. Is that and happening also, in person currently or is it all virtual? It's in person. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I'm really happy about that. Um, last semester we did hybrid, which means we were in person one week and then remote the next week Mm -hmm. and alternating. And we made the most out of it and the students were rock stars, but you know, it's just not the same teaching woodworking and having to be remote every other week. Right. And especially when you're dealing with students, I mean, it's not like they have a workshop at home that can just... um, have access to everything right remote um assemble them we put together these tool kits for them that had basic hand tools like a japanese saw and some clamps and uh buy on rafts but you know it's it's just not the same Mm -hmm. and people were living in dorms and it's not nice to create a lot of noise (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so, and I felt like every time we were in person, I had to like reteach a bunch of things. Like, this is how you use a combination square again, or mm-hmm. um, how you read a tape measure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I could see that being difficult for sure. 
Mm-hmm. Well, let's take a little bit of a step back, baby. And um, I just want you to, you know, tell me, tell me the story of Wu. Where did you uh, get your start in, in life, you know, as a kid? And um, how'd you get to where you are now? Ooh, like from the very beginning. <laughs> from the very beginning. <laughs> okay. So I was born in North Carolina, but then I grew up in Taiwan, which is like a, a island that's shaped like sweet potato off of China. And I was there from six to 12. And then after that, I moved to Austin, Texas, which was a big culture shock. <laughs> Um, and that's where I went to my undergrad, which is at UT Austin, which I studied graphic design when I was there. And while I was there, I also got to study abroad in Copenhagen. And that's where I learned furniture design and woodworking, which was like the best way to learn about woodworking (laughs) from like a bunch of Danish instructors and, um, and to be in Denmark when it was like summer, which means it was mostly daylight all of the time. Um, so that was a really life changing experience. So I came back to, to uh, UT and, and then I, I um, took another furniture class at UT. Um, and then after I graduated, I moved to New York City and or Brooklyn and then I worked as a furniture maker and I worked for a collective which I don't know if you know their work uh it was founded by three women and they're still like really good friends of mine they make awesome work and they've been really pioneers of you know like female design mm-hmm. and um and uplifting woman makers and designers mm-hmm um, and it was really awesome working for them. I, I really look up to them and admire them. Ooh, this is a long story. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, at some point I, I decided I wanted to teach. So that's when I decided to go back to grad school. And then I went to RISD for furniture design. Hmm. And then here I am. <laughs> and then here you are. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, I want to go back a little bit. So born in the States Mm -hmm. and then, you know, spent a good chunk of your childhood um, in Taiwan. Uh, What, what took you there? Like what did, what took your family there? Yeah. um, Mainly my, my dad's job. He, uh, he was at Duke, which is why we were in North Carolina Mm. And then after that, um, I think it was really hard for my parents being in the States. They were really far away from home and like knew a little bit of English. I mean, they, they knew enough English to like right. get through school and like have a job, but um, he had a job opportunity in Taiwan. So that's, that's why we moved back. Um, but then at some point they were like, oh, we want you to uh, have more opportunity, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you know, the American dream. So that's why we moved back to Texas. Um, and I moved with just my siblings and my cousins and my mom and my aunt. Okay. So I was pretty much raised by two moms, even though my, my parents were together, mm-hmm. um, the whole time. So, so yeah, that was, a. Uh, a lot of adapting and like yeah. assimilating and um, yeah. So <laughs> I got, well, I, I, I mean, I guess what was the experience like, I mean, you said it was a culture shock, but what was the experience like coming back to the States and in particular, you know, Texas is still is a Southern state. So what was it mm-hmm. like coming back into that culture 
um, you know, from being in Taiwan? It was a mixture of exciting, but also, like I said, like culture shock and just like having to relearn English and be mm -hmm. put in the English as a second language program and uh, and now that I look back on it, there was a lot of, or not a lot, but like there was discrimination happening at a level that I didn't understand mm -hmm. at the time when I was a child. Mm -hmm. You know, like if someone wanted to be friends with me, I, I saw that as like, oh, wow, this, this person wants to be friends with me when really like they wanted help on math or like they wanted to borrow my my eraser or whatever mm -hmm. um but and I think it was also just really hard to not to to not be with my dad you know growing up and mm -hmm. seeing seeing how that's affected me now as an adult right <laughs> um and I don't think I really realized that when I was going through it mm -hmm. well it was I mean as far as <clears throat> Asian American population, um, for where you were at, was there like a community there for, you know, your family to at least like participate in outside of school or um, were there many other Asian Americans at the school you went to? Not a whole lot. It was yeah, I would, I mean, I know everyone has a hard time in middle school and high school, but I would say <laughs> mine was particularly challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until I got to college that I, you know, I was in, not an art school, but I was in the art department. And so right. that was when I felt like I could really be myself <laughs> or like have yeah. friends that I felt like we mm -hmm. had a common interest in and like learn about other artists and art history and design and like and not feel so othered you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah what was I mean what was your ex uh, exposure or experience with art then as a kid you know that mm -hmm. led to you going into um an art type program in college? Yeah. Um, I didn't really have it in my upbringing as in like my parents and my, my family members, no one was an artist, but I was always in art classes. And I think that my art teachers would like tell my mom, oh, she's really talented. And like, mm -hmm. and so I just kept taking art, but in high school you have such a limited exposure to what that is meaning mm -hmm. I was just painting and drawing and so it wasn't until um college that I was like oh art can be three-dimensional <laughs> it can be sculptural it could right. be <clears throat> installation or performance and uh I oftentimes tell this story but when I was in my foundation year um I had a my, my 3D, 3D professor, her name was Bailey Liu, and she was a Chinese American woman. And she was definitely a, a formative um, teacher and mentor in my life. But she was like the first time I had, or one of the very few times I had someone who like looked like me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, an Asian woman can be an artists like they can make just art it doesn't have to be design it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be like serve a, a function really um and she was a and that was also like my first time really working with my hands and like making things that were sculptural um oh yeah I, I think back to her a lot <laughs> as a yeah. little freshman me. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there's something to be said, right? When you finally see representation of yourself yes. um, out in the world, there's definitely something to be said uh, about that. I had similar experience except for 
it was the first um it was the first queer teacher outwardly mm-hmm. queer teacher that I had and for me that was uh, an experience of like oh you mean we can like hold real jobs and not be this like person <laughs> of society that is you know an, an outcast type thing mm-hmm. um and she had a deep impact on me as as well but probably has no idea the impact that she had um mm-hmm. to a little freshman me as well um yeah. so I have to ask because I've had <clears throat> I've had other people on the podcast that um, are children, you know, of of immigrants, and there tends to be a theme of when you're a child of an immigrant. I have found that the idea is that you become a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. So I want to ask: Was there any pressure like that from your family at all that that would be the path that you should take to succeed? No, I'm very lucky. <laughs> um, I think my 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 mom has always been very like she she doesn't come from an artist like a art or design background, but she has a lot of appreciation for design in particular. So I think she kind of nudged me towards because at one point I was like, oh, should I do design or should I do sculpture because my teacher Bailey Liu is a sculptor and she's so cool (laughs) but um I think my mom did kind of nudge me in the design route but she wasn't um pushy about Mm -hmm. it Mm -hmm. and my my dad is a uh like a biochemistry Mm -hmm. uh scientist kind of person um and he's just like whatever you do I just want you to be happy Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um, they they were also the ones who pushed me to like pursue grad school. So they've been very supportive and very open-minded as um, a Taiwanese parent yeah, and yeah. Asian parents, yeah. Hey friends, I wanted to tell you about an awesome brand I discovered that you might love as well. Have you ever spent a ton of money on clothing that was supposed to be high performance only for it to end up at the back of your closet because it just doesn't fit right? I personally hate when this happens. I get excited about a new pair of work boots and then I'm disappointed to find out they just weren't designed for me. Discovering Athena Outfitters was a game changer for me. Athena Outfitters is a quality workwear brand for hardworking women. All of their items are handpicked to meet the needs of women in the trades, not just sized down versions of items designed for men. They've got great workwear essentials like comfortable, soft, and safety toe boots and options for my active lifestyle when I'm off the clock as well. Shopping with Athena Outfitters saves me time and energy because I always know I'm getting a high quality product that also looks and feels great. Next time you're looking for gear with grit, check out athenaoutfitters.com. That is A-T-H-E-N-A outfitters.com and use special code at checkout MM15 to get a 15% discount because you listen to the Maker Mom podcast. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, I mean, support to go after what you have interest in is always important from family. Yeah. Um, So you said, I mean, you, so did you, you took the furniture class abroad, took the furniture class when you came back. Did you Mm -hmm. still graduate undergrad though? Was it in graphic design when you graduated? It was technically in quote unquote design, but our our education was very, it was kind of more geared towards graphic design mm-hmm. and um, you know, also at a time when like things were starting to move digital and um, most of my, my peers and cohort from that time are in graphic design now. But mm-hmm. that being said, for my final project, I made a chair and a table. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <Yeah. clears throat> so, I mean, I feel like you've got you kind of landed like a super 
super sweet job out of uh, <laughs> out of college mm-hmm. um, with being able to to make furniture right away out of the gate like um, yeah. <laughs> Well, oh, okay. I should say that before I got the job with a collective, I worked for another furniture uh, studio called Asher Israelo. And it was through him that I met, met the a collective woman and ladies. And um, so I, I met them when it was just the three of them. And mm-hmm. uh, we started out as friends and I was like, oh, I really love your work. Like, and then we would, you know, see each other at parties and I was like eventually I was like I I would love to work for you guys and and they were you know cautious as and very thoughtful as Mm -hmm. as women are and (laughs) and they wanted to like do it right and and they did um they you know put me on payroll and um which I didn't have before and Mm -hmm. And I learned so much from, from working for them. So it was just uh, the three of them and then me for, for a year or so. And now they, they've grown a lot. Yeah. I know very little in the sense of like, I follow their social media. Uh-huh. Um, but <clears throat> um, is it a situation where like, are they designing and then you would have been or, you know, somebody in your position would be making their designs or they making as well? Um, like, I guess, what was your level of independence as far as like your, any of your design aesthetic or um, what was that role like? Yeah, it was, so it's, um let's see it was mostly just me and Stephanie who were in the wood shop and um Crystal is kind of the main designer and uh she would come up with the designs and then um the three of them would like talk about it and then I would help them a lot in the beginning of my time there with like prototyping and then Mm -hmm. us like kind of designing through prototyping um but other times it was like here's a drawing like go, go make it. Go make it. Um, yeah. So it was just me and Steph and Steph was like the, the finisher and, um, or <laughs> not just a finisher, but she, she's a very skilled, um, finisher and we would make things together. And then eventually they, they hired more help and, and then more help. And then now they have their own wood shop and their own, their own showroom. And, mm-hmm. um, they, really grown into uh who they are as a as a company but also like the the wood shop they have like Mm -hmm. they they've really grown into and they have probably outgrown it too (laughs) so it's really awesome to see to see that and eventually there were interns and other employees I would have to like train Mm -hmm. and I that's when I was like oh wow I I enjoy teaching like this is really fun and it's really mm-hmm. cool to see someone go from a, a sander to like making their first piece of furniture and um yeah yeah I mean so with your I mean with the experience after college or even in college as far as like kind of the wood shop piece of it right mm-hmm. um what was your experience there you know, as far as you being an Asian American woman, like was there a lot of other females? Were there, you know, was mm-hmm. there diversity in that space, I guess? Um, not, well, UT is like pretty, pretty white, mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, my, my teacher at at the it was through the school of architecture and I remember there were two monitors who were both women and they were like grad students and one of them has um the company lawn in Los Angeles Mm -hmm. Molly she's great um 
So there was a little bit of female representation, um, but not a whole lot. But I, I, I wouldn't say I felt like, yeah, I, I, I didn't notice it that much. Mm -hmm. And my, my teacher, Mark Maycheck, who I later also interned for him, but before like moving to New York, he was like very, very chill and like really great. And mm -hmm. um, and I was the only woman in his shop, but when I worked for him, there was a guy, Shota, who is Japanese and he was like a wizard. And I also learned a lot from him too. So yeah, there was like, at least there was Shota, now that I am talking mm -hmm. about, I'm remembering <laughs> that. <laughs> Um, but I, I never felt like anyone made me feel that I don't belong there, which is really nice too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess I feel like it's also, and maybe it's not, but I feel like it's also a bit of a unique experience, uh, for, you know, with you specifically working with the collective, cause it's three women and then, mm -hmm you know, you were in the, in the wood shop as a female. And so it's like, I just don't feel like that's like the most common, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> most common setup out there. <clears throat> um, I know there's quite a few women who are designers, um, mm -hmm. but not necessarily then on the other side of that, of the, the physical making of the product. Right. Yeah. When I first worked for Egg Collective, they were in a wood shop that was like, I still remember the address, 47 Hall Street. And it was the 10th floor of this building. And the wood shop had 10 businesses and it was all men. It was pretty much all men, except for another woman that was sometimes in and out. But um, it was just so cool to work for um, Egg. And they were just like, not apologetic about it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes we would go to the, the rose and swag, the, the lumber yard, and they'd be like, oh, you ladies, like, cats do this. <laughs> and then Steph would be like, no, I, I own a collect, or she would be like, she's not like <laughs> standoffish, I'm right, exaggerating, right. but she was just like, would just blow them off. And, um, and yeah, I was like, just yeah, don't be apologetic about it and just, mm -hmm. this is just what we do. Yeah. How do you feel that shaped you in your own, I mean, because you would have been there pretty early on in adulthood. Um, mm -hmm. How do you feel like that kind of shaped you moving into, you know, these roles that you hold now? Um. I think we, we said this earlier, but I think, I, I believe that representation matters a lot. And, um, you know, it mattered to me when I was a student and now like on the other side of things and being the teacher, like I, I, I think I, I, I have mostly female or woman students. Um, the, the school is, largely female for some reason. Like for example, in my woodshop class right now, I have uh, 10 students and nine of them are, are women. Wow. Yeah. And I can see some of them are, are timid and shy and like afraid of machines. And like, I'm sure it's, it's makes a difference in them that I'm a, a woman as opposed to, to a man. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was, I was talking to someone who also teaches at Mass Art and also taught this, this woodworking class. And he's a, a white guy. <laughs> and um, I remember he was like uh, showing me, you know, the assignments and like how to do certain projects because I was new to Mass Art. And he said something to me like, uh, we were talking about a project and he was like, yeah, um, you're gonna be uh, 
or he was telling me that he's surprised because there will be a Asian girl who's like in fibers and then they like are really quiet and then they end up with an amazing project and then he's like surprised I'm like what that's not surprising at all to me (laughs) right I'm like actually I think the opposite of someone like that turning out with an amazing project that's surprising to me Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know and just like hearing him say that I was like why would you assume that of someone just because they're a girl and Asian and like, you know, in ceramics or fibers that they can't figure out how to do something with wood. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, um, yeah, that's, I think that's how it's, it's shaped me. And like, I, because I am who I am, I don't really assume I, I don't assume what people can or can't do based on what they look like or who they are. Right. Exactly. I think <clears throat> I think at least currently that's somewhat of the difference between um, somebody who's been raised male or raised female or you know mm-hmm. socialized male or socialized female like. I think right now the way it works is women can tend to see that person as a whole person Mm -hmm. um, or at least empathize with them on a different level, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think, like you said, we don't end up maybe being as surprised by (laughs) by the outcome, right? (laughs) Yeah. Um, I mean, he was also like a different he's much older in a different generation. So I I don't, yeah. Uh, Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of things that play into it. Right. Um, And that's why I don't want to just like have a broad brush and say like all men are fit this cloth or anything like that. Um, Right. But I do believe a lot of it comes around just how you're socialized and um, through your childhood and through Mm -hmm. culture. Um, so now you teach, um, and I think that's awesome that you have so many women coming through your your program. Uh, what, um, in addition to teaching, though, are you still able to work on your own projects and your own designs? Um, not as much as I would hope. <laughs> uh, I kind of see that as what summers are <laughs> right now at least um you know I'm, I'm pretty new to to teaching and like I'm new to the curriculum so I'm still learning a lot as I go and um I most of the time I'm in my shop now I'm preparing for the classes because there's been changes we had to make because of um COVID or like or I'm teaching a new class for the first time. So I have to like run through demos mm-hmm. for, beforehand. Um, but I, I I hope that as I teach more, I will <laughs> just have a box of things already prepared. <laughs> and like, I just know in the back of my hand. And um, so no, not as much as I would hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's the focus, I guess, in the teaching right now? I mean, do you, does your program focus more on like a certain methodology or like hand tools versus power tools or any of that? I would say it's a pretty good balance of of both. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. We have a really amazing wood shop at MassArt and it's, it's relatively new. I think it's like five years old. So really great ventilation, which, Mm -hmm. you know, we're all talking about now. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so I feel lucky to be teaching in a well ventilated space. It also uh, has central air or AC during the summers, which I've never had before. (laughs) (laughs) And it's uh, kept squeaky clean. So um, and it has pretty much all the machines uh, we don't have like a 
like a CNC yet, but it has pretty much everything else mm -hmm. and really great hand tools. And our shop managers are amazing. They're like constantly sharpening chisels and blades, which it was definitely not like that RISD. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the shared chisels are like so dull. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, and it's one of those things that like the students have no idea how lucky they are. You know, mm -hmm. they just like come at eight and they leave at one. I'm like, you guys, like, you're not going to have this after four years. No. <laughs> <laughs> There's even like free sandpaper. Oh my gosh. Like what a luxury. I know. <laughs> they have no idea. <laughs> And so it like hurts me so much when I see them like scrolling on their phones during break or, um, you know, they just, they don't know. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, yeah, is it predominantly like it, the, the people coming through your program, are they like, I guess more like traditional, like right out of high school type students, or do you have any? <clears throat> coming through like uh, as more of a non-traditional student yeah um so projects in wood which is like a prerequisite for 3d students mm -hmm. which is why I have a lot of students who don't want to be there and they're like oh I'm a fiber major why do I have to be in this woodworking class <laughs> and I'm like wood is amazing <laughs> <laughs> um and most of them are sophomores, so mm -hmm. they are pretty young. But yeah, uh, I have worked with a few furniture certificate students, which is this program they have at Mass Art. So those students are usually older, and they have like a, a, a day job, or mm -hmm. um, or they're like kind of not working or retired, right? <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by ToolMomStore.com. ToolMom and company is for all ages, genders. They have what you need for your one-stop tool-related merchandise of gifts and clothing. Uh, the products are fun, fashionable, one-of-a-kind. In fact, I have two of the mugs. Uh, one has a circular saw with flames coming off of it. It says, Go Girl. Another one has the definition of a tool chick. Both of them are super awesome, and I have coffee out of them almost every morning. So check out toolmomstore.com or find them on Instagram at toolmombonnie. You can receive an extra 20% off at a checkout by using the code MAKERMOM. I would imagine um, so yeah, exactly. those students, though, understand the joys of like a fully functioning shop at oh, their yes. disposal. <laughs> yes. And they, they want to be there and they're mm -hmm. like working the whole time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so <clears throat> as part of those programs, I guess I, I want to ask this fact about, you know, I feel like a lot of, a lot of people uh, can be successful definitely at making furniture like for themselves, for their family, for, you know, in that type of market, if you want to call it that. But outside of that, I mean, you kind of have, you've seen the full range of this world, I guess. You've seen it from education through to like a successful business, right? Being run around it. Mm -hmm. Just <laughs> Do you, is, is that like the unicorn though? Is, is like, you know, an egg collective, like the unicorn of the world where you can be successful, um, and make it work. Uh, it just, it seems like it's, it's a lot harder than, um, maybe people expect when they go 
through a college program? Oh yeah, it's <laughs> definitely. I mean, to I think it's one thing to run a successful business. It's another thing to like unprofitable. Um, it's another thing to like be constantly pushing the boundaries, right? Mm-hmm. To like come out with new designs and and also to like have a working environment that's that the feels like a community and feels positive and feels mm-hmm. like where someone like me wakes up and wants to be at work and like right. excited to see your your colleagues and your coworkers and also to like treat your clients and contractors and subcontractors with respect and like that's that's the hard part to like do all of those things mm-hmm. and not just like how do I make something profitable like I mean, we, I guess we, we even talked about my, my studio practice, which mm-hmm. is working youth, which is, it's, it's more just like a passionate side hustle, right? Yeah. I, <laughs> 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 and it's, uh, I, I, I can do that because I'm, because I'm teaching and, right. um, but I also need that in order to teach. Yep. Right. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, let's, let's talk about work and use. What do you, what do you make with work and use? I make sculptural movement tools. And so I have a balance rail. I have uh, I'm just like looking around my, yeah. my I have like a pull up bar. I have gymnastic rings. I have um, the set of brass weights behind me. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's the line. <laughs> that's the line. How'd you how'd you come up with the line? How'd I come up with it? Mm-hmm. Uh, I was in grad school, and I was getting really into my my movement training, and it started out with my coach was like, "Hey, you have to do a bunch of balancing." And I was like, okay, I don't have a balance rail <laughs> and it's cold outside. So I don't want to do it on a railing. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'll make one. And then after I made that, I had a, like a cheap pull bar from Amazon. I was like, oh, this thing sucks. Like we have nice furniture. Like, why do I have this pull bar? <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I'll just make the pull bar. And then I kind of just went from there. And so that that became my my thesis work, and then, and yeah, that's that's what I do now. And I also I also teach movement online. So I feel like I'm teaching a lot more than I w- I thought I would, but <laughs> <laughs> but people want to learn, so that's that's great. Yeah. So I mean, is it? <clears throat> Is the the side hustle part of it, like, are you making these, uh, this line and selling it? Is it like, or, um, and how do people find, find your work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, it is so sale. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It's pretty niche and, um, you know, everything is made by me or like made by uh, people in the region. So in um, Rhode Island and um, we're in the Northeast, but everything I, I assembled at, at my shop. Um, and I don't make a ton of sales. Like it's not a, at this point, it's not a profitable <laughs> business. <laughs> But I have a lot of fun and I'm trying to come up with more products or like more things that are easier to produce or like Mm -hmm. things that I can do myself. Um, Meaning it's made out of wood. (laughs) Right. right. Um, And also just like trying to hit a lower uh, target in terms of price, because that seems to be the things that sell 
more easily are the the dowels and the parallel bars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's always that hard part, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Find, finding something that it's like you enjoy making mm-hmm. uh, that you can make well and efficiently and somebody will buy it for the price you need to sell it for. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> exactly. So what about this um you know you 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 said it it's your passion so what about it makes it your passion? Well, I I use it every every day and um I I made it mostly for my training and there are still things that I'm like that sometimes is like a new thing in my training. I'm like, oh, I don't have, let's say like a sledge board, for example, which, or sorry, a slant board, which is just a board that's at an angle so that you can squat and have um, it be more of a quad dominant exercise. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's another thing I, I kind of want to like investigate and um, make nicer Um and I think that's that's the fun part in me, well, a fun part in it for me. Um, you know, it's also kind of like making a piece of furniture where like, oh, I'm going to design a chair, but how do I make that me? Or like, how do mm-hmm. I make that different and new? So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. You mentioned your shop. So you have your own shop space um, that you work from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm in a, a shared shop. Uh, it's called the Smokestack Studios, and it's in Fall River. Uh, and it's mostly furniture makers in there, and like mostly people who there's a lot of teachers in there too. Um, so, so yeah, it's a it's a great shop and. Um, and it's by the water, so I feel peace and calm when I get there. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's my shop. How long have you been working in that space? Uh, just uh, around a year. So I, I, after I graduated from RISD, like that shop space was like pulled away from me <laughs> right away. <laughs> they like deactivated our ID cards within a day um (laughs) (laughs) which was like brutal um so and then I was in another shop space for a year and now I'm in the shop space and that's been it's been really great and yeah it's a it's a good community Mm -hmm. do you feel like it's easier hard to find shop space um like in the city that's a good question. It's because I was looking for a while and um, it depends on what you need. Like for me, there were certain shared artist spaces that were a great community or like even way closer to where I live, but they didn't have all the tools, mm-hmm. you know, like maybe they had a a shitty table saw or like mm-hmm. maybe they had like a drill press and a band saw, but to not have a jointer and planer. So um, in that sense, this this, uh, place in Fall River is like 20 minutes away from me. And I thought it would be too far, but it's been been really nice to like have that separation and like, and and to like see people or you just see people. (laughs) I remember when like, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> everything shut down and I was like a terrified of COVID B terrified of like the anti-Asian violence and like and a bunch of other anxiety mm-hmm. but to like just go there and like <laughs> see another human that's not my partner was like really nice <laughs> <laughs> I get that. I do get that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what what do you feel like is is the 
dream for you right now? What's the dream? What's the oh dream? <laughs> oh. Um. What's the dream? Uh, would it be annoying if I say that I'm feel like I'm living it? <laughs> it would not be annoying. It would not be annoying at all. <laughs> I mean, this is what I wanted. I wanted to to teach full time and I wanted to like have a studio practice. I, I guess the dream, okay, here's the dream, is to get to a point in my, my, my teaching that I can, my, my teaching practice where I can know what I'm doing and like have more of a more compartmentalization. Mm. So like on the days I'm teaching, I'm fully there. I'm teaching on the days that I'm not at school. I'm just in my my studio and my shop and working mm-hmm. on my own things. I'm not looking at my school email or like <laughs> thinking about my students. And mm-hmm. that's that's the dream. Makes yeah. makes complete sense to me. <laughs> I, have, I have I do have to ask though when you're teaching, do you have this like I I imagine I would have this issue when you're teaching and you're watching the creative process of your students go through and you know design or create whatever, does that end up sparking you down these rabbit holes of like, oh, I really wanna make that or you know, start coming up with your own designs while you're watching them create? Um, I imagine I would end up with like a notebook full of things that would end up being like, I want to make this, 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 and this. <laughs> um, not a whole lot, but I, the, the fun part about it is like, I'm learning from them all the time. And like some, some of them have ideas. I'm like, wow, that's, that's so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so so it is like very uh, rewarding and like exciting all the time, and um, and yeah, it's like I I really enjoy teaching them like the design process, um, like how to think through. Uh, design and like the creative process of that because there is a a method to it um but oh another dream I have is for things to be to be open again and like I I love being a student still (laughs) (laughs) like I, I love learning uh like taking glass blowing classes and like going to craft schools mm-hmm. and like I, I would love to like take more learning classes and um yeah I really like being in a being a student but also like being in a learning environment mm-hmm. yeah same here it's been a, it's been a while since I've been in a classroom but I've definitely maybe it's maybe it's because of COVID been getting the itch of like I want to, like, I'd love to go take some courses at like Penland or something. Um, Yeah. You know, (laughs) just be surrounded by people who know know. (laughs) way more than me, but that I can learn from. Um, I think it would be super fun. Yeah. Um, Well, we're, we're pretty close to the end of our time together. So Mm -hmm. I want to give you a chance to let people know like how they can find you um, and and see all of your your work. Yeah, uh, my website is workanduse.com. Singular <laughs> work and use. Uh, if you don't want to check out what the plural is. Um, and that's also my Instagram is work and use. And I am teaching movement classes and we have a lot of beginners. So if someone wants to take a movement class with me, uh, you can go to geeks.glass, but also that's also in my my Instagram link as well. Uh, 
I think that's, yeah, that's all I have. <laughs> it's Instagram and a website. <laughs> so I, I guess I have to ask, did you come up with work in use because it also spells woo? That was part of it. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, my, my wonderful friend that my branding and we like brainstorm a bunch of names and that was one of them when I told them they were like they could just see the graphics in their head and they're like yes that's it <laughs> <laughs> so uh they were the the ones behind that but yes yes I think it's fantastic branding oh um, thank you <laughs> yeah it allows you to like still get your name out there right mm-hmm. like the Sometimes that's the trouble with a name. You can settle on a name, but then it's like the brand takes on its own thing and it loses right. some of you behind the brand. Right. Um, so yeah, awesome. Well, I'll include links on um, how people can find you in the show okay. notes. Thank you. And uh, thanks for chatting with me. Thank you so much. This is really fun and you're a really good listener. Thank oh, you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So again, that was Woo of Work in Use, and I will include the links on how you can follow along with her in the show notes for today's episode. You can find those in the description on whatever podcast app you're listening on, or if you are watching this on YouTube, look in the description down below. Um, If you enjoyed this week's episode and any other previous episodes, please remember to hit that subscribe like, and comment, head on over to iTunes, leave a five-star review. All of that is really appreciated. Check out Patreon. Now, to find us over on Patreon, you're going to have to look under the former name of the podcast, which is the Maker Mom Podcast, but you can still find, uh, find me over there on Patreon and check out joining the tribe and what kind of swag is available and additional perks like extra content. When I am not making podcasts, you can find me designing and making furniture and home decor over at freemanfurnishings.com and at Freeman Furnishings across pretty much all the social media, though I am active on a daily basis on Instagram and TikTok if you want to see what current projects I am up to or what uh, dance moves are going on in the shop currently. All right, it is Friday, heading into the weekend. I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. Get to spend time with your families and get out and make something. I will see you all next week.